Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Holy Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity to be here today and we ask that your word may be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In Jesus' name, amen. So what are people talking about here lately? Fruit Loops. Well, perhaps. Um, maybe when you're a little younger. What's the big topic on every, all the conversation that everybody's talking about right now? Did I hear gas prices? <clears throat> yes. Oh, my goodness. Every time you drive down the street, they keep going up and up and up, right? Except for, I actually saw them going down yesterday at one place. Um, it's the Murphy's across the street from Walmart, in case anybody was wondering. Um, it was three ninety last night. Um, but it's crazy, isn't it? And whose fault is that? Don't answer. Um, so we all know who we blame. I mean, I don't know much about how all this stuff works. You know, I, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of decisions that go into this and a lot of moving parts. But when something goes wrong like this, we usually blame the person at the top. And, and if that person happens to be the President of the United States, no matter who's sitting there at the time, that's who we blame. And it's not just our elected officials, you know, not just national, state, or, or city. I mean, we do the same thing if things go wrong at, at our, our companies, at our churches, wherever. The person at the top usually catches the blame, right? So what happens when something goes wrong in our lives? Who do we blame then? Well, we typically blame God. I mean, for instance, and I know I've told you all this before. Um, when I was a rising senior in high school, I was at a national youth gathering, and a voice from God said to me, Stephen, be a pastor. Now, that sounds strange to me still 30 years later that I heard a voice from God. But whatever it was, it changed the entire course of my life. And so I went from there, finished up high school, went to college, the whole time studying to go into seminary, and then I, I, you know, I applied to seminary, I went through all the psychologicals, and passed, <laughs> um, passed the psychologicals, uh, got into seminary, was taking the classes, passing the classes, jumped through all the hoops, you know, you have to get entrance into seminary, and then you have to get endorsed in order to go on internship, spend a year on internship, and, and then you, you have to write this big, long essay called an approval essay, and then you meet with a panel of the seminary faculty, and then you meet a, with a panel from your synod, and that happens long about December. And so the final semester of seminary is absolute insanity, because after you're approved, then you start looking forward to the rest of your life. But see, just because you're approved to be ordained um, by the church, and they say, yes, God really has called this person, you still have to be called by a congregation to serve. If you're going to be a pastor or a deacon, you can't just graduate from seminary. You have to get called first. And so, I was. The, what happens after, after you're approved is you go through, or at least you used to go through this thing that we called the ELCA draft. And all of the candidates from all over the country and all the seminaries, their names would go in there, and then um, a handful of bishops would get together and basically decide what region of the country or the ELCA the person would go to. Thankfully, I was drafted by Region 9, which is the Southeast. Um, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, the Southeastern Senate, and Florida, Bahamas. And then those bishops get together and they decide which of those synods you're going to go to. And I was drafted by the North Carolina Senate. But then, after that, you have to go and interview at congregations. Now, I knew where I was going to go. I had it all mapped out. Because, you see, earlier that year, um, the senior pastor of a church in Taylorsville, North Carolina left and went to this town called Lexington, South Carolina to a church called St. Stephen's Lutheran Church. Pat Riddle, if any of you know, y'all know Pat. And so he left behind his associate who became the senior pastor and Todd was only about 30 years old. And so he was a senior pastor at 30 and all of the other newly graduated seminarians who were coming into North Carolina were all second career except me. 
So it made perfect sense that the 30-year-old senior pastor would have a 25-year-old associate pastor, right? Makes complete sense. So I went and interviewed there. Felt like the interview went well. Looked around, you know, great. I was expecting the phone call. In the meantime, the Senate called me and said, hey, we also want you to interview at, at another church in Lincolnton, which is not far from there. Okay, but I'm still waiting to hear back from this one church. Still waiting, still waiting. And the day came that I had to travel up to North Carolina from Columbia to interview the other place. And I still hadn't heard from the first one. So I picked up the phone and called. And I said, you know, I haven't heard anything. You know, I'm about to go on another interview. Do I need to call and tell them that I'm coming or no? I said, oh, we didn't tell you? Yeah, no, it's a no. I was devastated. And yet I still had to get in the car and drive up for another interview. Which I did and sort of went through the whole grieving anger process on the way. I get there. It was a great interview. Wonderful church. Stacy loved it. Wonderful community. It was like 15 minutes from my parents. Perfect. And so, I, and the senior pastor there, I knew him, known him for years. It was awesome. That next Monday, I got a call. Yeah, no, we're going another direction. Thursday was graduation. The week I graduated from seminary, I was turned down by two congregations. So, I was, had gone through high school, college, and seminary with this notion that I was called by God. God had set himself be a pastor. And here I was about to finish everything, and I didn't have a job. I didn't have any prospects. I didn't have any hope. I had nothing. Where were you, God? You've probably been there. I think we've all been there at some point in our lives. You know, maybe it's we were waiting to get the job that we wanted or, or make a team or make some great grades or get into the right school. Maybe it's that we were waiting for the, our spouse, Mr. or Ms. Wright, to come through the doors. Maybe we were waiting for healing or health. Maybe we were waiting to have a child. That's what was going on with Abraham. Abraham had been promised by God. God shows up out of the middle of nowhere and says, Abraham, I'm choosing you. You are going to be the father of many nations. And your offspring will be as many as the stars in the sky. All, and I, so I need you to get up and go to the land that I'll show you. So Abraham did. He got up and went. And then he went and he, he settled in and had a nice farm, a lot of livestock. And, you know, his, his nephew, Lot, was there and things were going great. And then a famine hit. So he picks up his family and all his stuff and they go to Egypt. And when he gets to Egypt, he's like, you know, Sarah, you're really pretty. And I'm a little worried that they might kill me and everybody around us and take you so that Pharaoh can marry you. So you just tell them I'm your sister. You're my sister. I don't know. It's the Old Testament. I didn't write it. And, and so, so he did that, and Pharaoh took her into his home, and things didn't go well because, you know, she was married and sort of by God's chosen. And so Pharaoh says, uh, here, you take her back. This is bad, and gives him a bunch of riches and stuff just to get out of, out of Egypt. So he goes, goes and settles again. Lot takes the, the west side. He takes the east side, and everything flourishes. Lot gets kidnapped, and so he goes and saves him, and then he's blessed by Melchizedek. And, and so things go from good to bad to good to bad to good. And then what we have here today is Abraham having another encounter with God. And God telling him once again, hey, you're going to be the father of many nations, and your descendants are going to be so plentiful as like the stars in the sky. And Abram is like, yeah, but... Uh, I, I don't have any kids, God. You know, you, you said this was a promise. And so I picked up and I left where I was and I went here and then I picked up and I left where I was and I went there and then I come back and, and all this stuff is going on and I still don't have any kids. And my heir is some Eliezer of Damascus that nobody's ever heard of. And, you know, so maybe I'll, I'll get a slave girl pregnant and maybe that'll be my heir. I got no kids. What do you mean there's, there's going to be 
a lot of descendants. Abraham waited and waited and waited until he was like, where are you, God? And so God does something for us that's pretty strange. In fact, when we were in our staff meeting on Monday talking about, you know, I, I was thinking, I think I'm going to preach on Genesis. Deacon Deborah said, that text is nasty. And it kind of is. It's a little graphic. Do you remember, you remember when you would make promises when, as a kid? You'd say, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. It's kind of like that, only worse. Because, I mean, did anybody actually stick a needle in their eye? No. But here's what they would do back then. They would take animals and they would cut them in two. And they would take one half of the animal over here and one half of the animal over there. And make a path. And the person who was making the promise would walk down in between those two halves of the animal... As if to say, if I break this promise, may the same happen to me. And so, and so, as we're hearing this story, we're thinking, okay, it's time for Abraham to make a promise to God. Because he's the one cutting the animals and setting them up. He's going to make a promise. Because doesn't that make sense? I mean, usually, we're the ones making promises to God, or so we think. You know, we're the people. He's God. He doesn't have to say anything to us. We have to make the promises. We have to step up. We have to respond. We have to do all this. But then something quite strange happens. A deep sleep comes over Abraham. And it's God who walks down the middle. It's God who makes the promises and says, "If, if I don't keep this promise, may this happen to me. Because what we know is that God stays good on his promises. God keeps his promises. And so, here we are many generations later, because Abraham did have as many descendants as the stars in the sky. Uh, there, there, there came Isaac, and, and, then, and then Jacob, and Esau, and after that, so many descendants, because God keeps his promises. I mean, in my own life. Look, I'm standing here before you today. So obviously, even though I was turned down by two churches, somebody said yes along the line, including Pisgah. God keeps his promises. And God keeps his promises in our lives as well. And we know this, my friends, because God promised a Messiah. God saw the brokenness of the world, the fact that we needed salvation. And so he sent his own son who gave his life for us. And he kept his promise not only through the death but through the resurrection of Jesus giving us the promise of life and life eternal we have the promise through baptism that we are never alone no matter what we have the promise that God is always with us forever does that mean that life's always going to be a bed of roses no does that mean everything's going to always go as exactly how we thought it would no But we do have the promise that God is always with us. And that no matter how bad it gets, we have that hope of eternal life in the end. And see, that's how we go through our lives. See, in in our first lesson it said that Abraham believed in God and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. In other words, because Abraham believed and trusted in God, he responded to that promise. Throughout his life, he responded by by obeying God, by doing what God called him to do. And you and I, as people of the promise, are also called to, to live out our faith, to respond to the Holy One. Which means that as we trust in God, we trust him with our actions. We do things that may be difficult, that may be out of the ordinary, that may be uncomfortable. But because we trust God, we do them. We trust God with our words, speaking out for those who have no voice. We trust God with our money by being generous to those who have nothing. We trust God with our lives by sharing our gifts to show God's love. We trust God because God stays good on his promises. Our Heavenly Father keeps the promises that he makes and he promises to us that he will be with us 
and that no matter what, we'll be with him to the end. And there is no end. We have a God who keeps his promises. We have hope. We have trust. We have faith.